printed it out. Is this on? Yeah. I suggest that we will start now. I know after lunch, it's always, uh, it can be difficult to proceed to the next event, but we are very happy to see you here uh, with such a large group. And uh, the topic of uh, our workshop here is um, data governance for smart and mobility. 
And um, I'm still waiting to see my slides. But um, I can just, while it's being, okay, excellent. So here you also can read the, uh, the title. And if I can go to the next slide. So the, the flow of the workshop will be such that I will uh, quickly introduce you to the topic. Then uh, Professor Max von Grafenstein will tell us about our research project on data governance and what we have discovered so far. Then we will have three very interesting impulse presentations on the topic of smart city mobility and data governance in that context. And then we will proceed to the interactive part of, uh, of our workshop, that being roundtable discussions on the topic. And here I should note that uh, there are participants online and online participation is, is feasible and possible and very much encouraged. So uh, you may already uh, now uh, make comments in the chat and during the roundtable discussion, there will be a parallel online roundtable discussion on this topic. However, I must note that uh, in this workshop, we will not take uh, calls for speeches um, from online participants, but we very much encourage making your comments and giving us feedback uh, in the chat box of Zoom application. Yeah, so um, next. So uh, to introduction of the topic. So the reason why we wanted to organize this workshop is essentially, I think every one of us have witnessed the two uh, mega trends in the society. First one is global uh, urbanization and exponential growth of cities, uh, which often introduce problems with traffic, such as congestions, environmental concern, questions about accessibility. And at the same time, we see a, a fast rise of data-driven innovation, such as Internet of Things, big data, AI, and technologies that essentially are based for processing of data and using it for novel purposes. And this brings us to smart city mobility. So um, could there be an answer to the problems of urbanization in organizing mobility in a smarter way, in a more data-driven way? And can this be done in a manner which is bringing us more equality, more efficiency, sustainability? And in our opinion, we need to acknowledge that when we think of uh, smart city mobility, is that all these solutions, they rely on collection and processing of vast amounts of data. Sometimes it's non-personal data, sometimes it's uh, data collected from citizens that are in the city or in uh, objects of transportation. And we believe that data governance is a prerequisite for smart city mobility that respects our right to privacy and data protection, but also often other fundamental rights. And also we take a view that data governance also supports the fulfillment of uh, UN sustainable development goals in the context of smart city mobility. And often this brings a uh, balancing act, for example, for uh, fostering innovation and on the other hand, uh, enabling equality in cities. And um, we have also noticed that when we talk about data governance, especially in the context of urban mobility, it's a dialogue between different stakeholders. Uh, we have, on the other hand, uh, here municipalities who have interests perhaps in more efficient public uh, transportation. Uh, there are interests of citizens. There's only one person in the picture, but actually there's a, a large variety of a lot of different uh, interest group. And Essentially, uh, transportation concerns everyone who lives in a city and outside the city. We have big tech players who have traditionally collected a lot of data, and then we have um, automotive industry and other actors in the area of transportation who are now encountering digitalization of the industry. And these are only examples of the tensions that might be present and interests that are present when one organizes smart city mobility solutions. And next, I will give floor to uh, Max von Grafenstein. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Alina, for the um, introduction. I thought I'd just give you, before we come to the key, um, keynote speakers, a very brief overview about the, um, actually about the reason why we are now organizing this workshop um, on data governance um, in the context for smarter city mobility. Because actually, Alina, uh, partly Christopher and I, we were um, assessing or now the question of uh, data governance since almost two years in um, very different contexts. And um, the overwhelming question there is always how the different stakeholders in certain contexts, like the advertising context or automotive context or smart city context, whatever, um, how the different stakeholders involved have actually to coordinate in order to unchain their um, data-driven innovative capacities and on the other hand, simultaneously, to protect effectively against the risks of these innovations. So this is the over, um, um, overwhelming uh, uh, or overarching uh, question. And in order to give you um, um, an insight or an impression why this question is rather complex, I would, um, um, I would like to give you an example of data protection law. So the complexity stems initially from uh, the fact that we are all uh, now deeply embedded in highly dynamic network uh, uh, economies. And this means that um, all the different uh, stakeholders rely on each other, and this brings uh, or on different levels, like the technical, the organizational, the normative level, and this makes these um, a coordinative um, efforts uh, so difficult. And to just give you an example from data protection law, most of you or many of you probably know that this very new famous um, European law, the so-called um, the general data protection regulation, and there we have a very new requirement in it, which is called data protection by design, which requires data-driven companies, so let's say um, uh, data controllers, to implement the legal requirements into the technical organizational design. And the tricky thing with this is that the, the, the companies, the data-driven com uh, companies, are primarily legally responsible to implement the technical um, uh, 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 conditions, but in fact they rely on other third-party IT uh, um, technology, prov um, so technology providers. So, um, but these technology providers are not at least not fully responsible. So both parties have to interact in order to finally meet the expectations, uh, the privacy expectations of the citizens. Yeah? So this is just uh, uh, an example. And so we did this research now for almost two years in different contexts and always um, analyzing the different analytical uh, dimensions. So how do they interact on a technical level? How do they interact on the rulemaking level? And how do they interact shaping the organizational level in order to connect both levels. Yeah? This was always the question. And after two years, um, we fin finally came up with um, five qualities of data governance models. So these are very generic models, but it might give you already an impression how um, the results of our uh, interactive workshop uh, later on might look like. So we came up with five very generic but uh, qualities of data governance solutions. So the first one is, of course, the single source solution in data protection law, often known as, OK, this is the consent-based model, where just each data subject must consent to the collection and processing of its or their personal data, which, of course, has some advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is it has full control, yeah, but actually, in fact, it has not, because it's so overwhelmed by um, um, yeah, the abundantness of consents uh, required by them. So a more feasible solution might be now, I jump to the third one, the data pool, where different data controllers interact with each other and collect all the data and store it in one common shared data pool. Yeah? So this is a much more scalable so solution, but in terms of data security law, this is also much more risky because in the moment one hacker breaks in, um, uh, then it, it, uh, it's a huge security breach. So, we have a more compromised, um, we discovered um, a compromise. This is the data clearinghouse, where the data is not stored, stored centrally, but where the different data controllers somewhat interact through standardized um, APIs, um, maybe also on the rulemaking level, and, and then they only share different data for uh, certain purposes. 
And in the very end, of course, we have also the future picture, the fully decentralized models, um, for example, based on a blockchain, as we already know it now from the Decode project in Barcelona. <laughs> so um, this is actually already um, a very first impression, and Alina will give you now, before we then come to the keynote speakers, um, a brief overview about how the, um, how the interactive workshop really looks like. I will actually uh, introduce the interactive workshop after the Impulse presentation, but I will introduce uh, our first speaker. So Mr. Choi is coordinator of Korea Internet Governance Alliance, and he conducts research also on data regulation and algorithmic decision making and relationship of infrastructure and mass, su mass surveillance. And um, yeah, we will give floor to him. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Great to see you. Uh, so, okay. Uh, as you know, South Korea is uh, one of the very tech savvy country all over the world. Because uh, did you hear hear about some 5G networks? South Korea only studied 5G networks. It's much faster and the very uh, it's available very acute uh, information changes and uh, it, and then. Um, 5G networks it comes with some kind of privacy concern because it collected many things. Uh, um, I, I show you somehow the combination of 5G networks and smart city going to be a very dramatic uh, change of your life. And then, uh, if you come back to maybe 20 years ago, uh, when I was in college, uh, there is no email address, no internet. But today it's changed. It's like this, is that the same thing going to happen? This is a, another new phenomenon of the wave. Okay, uh, data governance challenge from the global east, there is a several things. Uh, okay, as you see, uh, just please, I, I strongly suggest you remember that smart city consists of sensors, IoT devices, CCTV, is collected everywhere, even though you didn't recognize it. Uh, in daily life, we just encounter 500 CCTV all over the world every day. This is huge. And the second is there's a network, digital communications. It's a 5G, 4G, LTE, public Wi-Fi network. In case of Seoul, Seoul has a fully available public Wi-Fi. That means it go, that all of data goes to the one uh, data pool, as uh, Professor Marx mentioned, that there's a data pool model is uh, totally typical in South Korea. So uh, it comes with it everywhere. And the third one is the cloud-based infrastructure. We can call it data hub or data clearing house. It's inevitable. And the important thing is that smart city does not constructed by government officials. It, it, together with some ICT company, Google, Huawei, or Samsung everywhere, this is one of the very lucrative business to the ICT companies. This is why they going to design smart city infrastructure. The problem is that they have no incentive to protect privacy. That is uh, our concern. That is the civil society voice should be intervened there, I strongly believe. Uh, and the five is the integrated control platform, city center. Even though somebody control this, this is a, uh, this is a problem. The, who going to control? Who going to control? Who is allowed to control every citizen's privacy? This is a key question. Uh, here is a breakdown of tech element of smart city. This is an IP network, Wi-Fi, cloud, I, see, I already told that. Uh, is a full, okay. Here is a, here's the IST, this is the mobility uh, of the grid, smart mobility there. Uh, one, of the, one of the smart city functionality, this is smart mobility, which is a, a topic of today. And then, as you see, there's some, uh, as you see, there's an internet of things, device everywhere. Okay, here's a smart city case in Seoul. Uh, high speed communication network is available all over the world, like here. This is a much more highly dense network I can say, I can say so. Amongst all of the world, Seoul is one of the best network sites, uh, secu uh, uh, the connected society in the world. And then there's some, uh, oh yeah, when it comes to traffic, they use, they use this data topics, CCTV, they all together, they is monitored. And then uh, this night all boss also. That means uh, people just cannot go back to home in the night and they just, uh, the city just uh, analyzed big data and so that they made a new line of night or which is very cheap. 
Okay, here is an expansion of a shared parking system just like this. Okay, we, okay, our, when I was, went to New York City, I just uh, traveled around the whole time to, because to find a parking lot. And, but in this case, IoT device just notify where it's available, just like this. And here's the AI-based AI taxi. You know that, do you, you, even though you do not imagine what it means AI, AI just, we can say, AI is analysis of data. And this functionality is AI. And this is uh, available, AI text is available because of data we have. This is smart, smart city have uh, some cross work. That means if there is somebody uh, just go, uh, if the very old uh, female just walk down, or small children just running outside. Of the, but the IoT device notice that and they notify to the uh, moving mobiles. This is a really amazing um, functionality, but the problem is that as, as you see the same kind of the, the light street lamp, street lamp does not only capture the crime, they capture the whole traffic volume and they capture the, some private activity and they, uh, you can urinate in front of the, 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 the street lamp, they will capture you. This is really, uh, it's too much, that means uh, city designers totally depend on, totally focus on the functionality and efficiency of and how they analyze big data for the public use. The problem is that that purpose comes with privacy imprisonment. You know that? You may have heard about the internet never forget. Smart city data never deleted. This is, a, this is how I met up with this. So South Korea has supported a lot of money to with the more than 50,000 IoT sensors all across the, across the city. That's, that's, do you believe this is really amazing? No, no, we just, we just concerned that we, there's no guarantee, no policy, data policy framework that guarantee privacy of citizens. That is what I'm saying. This is a serious, okay. And then Professor Marx also mentioned about the GDPR. The, the, I, I wanna ca ask a question. Does we, are we ready for Smart city, are we, are we, are there, are they, uh, are smart city ready for uh, GDPR compliance? That's a big question. But as far as I know, I, I know, uh, uh, smart city designers not much consider how can they comply uh, GDPR. This is a, a big question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, our next presenter is Dr. Sawyer, who's Head of Political Affairs and Government Relations at Bosch. And um, Bosch is one of, I think it's the biggest supplier for automotive industry. As far as I know, yes. Yeah. So this is a very interesting input from you to hear what's your view on uh, smart city mobility. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, share some, some insights with you today. Um, as was already mentioned, where can I go with the slides? Here. Um, oh, the big one. Ah, the big one. Uh, as, I, um, as, as already mentioned, I'm uh, working for Bosch. Most of you probably uh, know the company. We are um, one of the leading international providers of technology and services and are uh, heavily uh, investing in transforming our um, manufacturing company into an IoT company, which means investing several billion euros or dollars um, every year in R&D activities. Um, what does Bosch consist of? Um, Bosch consists of uh, approximately 410,000 employees worldwide, which is more than Siemens, uh, I would like to mention. And <laughs> Slightly more than Siemens. Um, we have almost 270 plants worldwide, uh, 130 engineering locations, hiring more and more software architects, software engineers, um, as you can imagine, and about uh, 460 uh, regional subsidies in 60 countries worldwide. So we are active on every uh, continent on this planet. Um, yeah, I will um, most probably not, um, I will skip that and most probably not stick too much with my uh, presentation, but rather give you some, some examples from the Bosch universe. Um, we heard something about data, we heard something about AI today already, and um, 
often people say data is the oil of our age. I think oil is something dirty, so I prefer to call data uh, the air uh, of our time. And it is, of course, a prerequisite for AI-based business models. And um, when you think about AI, uh, most people do not know that AI is already part of our daily lives. It's uh, fundamentally changing how we drive, how we shop, how we work, how we travel. Um, so it's um, already there. Um, at Bosch, um, AI is becoming part of our products too. Um, that means products um, will assist and support us and make life easier overall. However, um, when you consider it from a societal point of view, it's um, pretty obvious that you have to think about when it, what it means when you have a technology that learns itself. So it's a point you have to think about it. It's an ethical um, discussion necessary about it. Um, what do we have to take into consideration when we are dealing with AI, smart cities, smart living, and so on? We have to take into consideration boundary conditions. And what do I mean with boundary conditions? We have to uh, work within boundary conditions to develop smart things in three domains as a company, in uh, mobility, in residential, and in industry. And I want to give you a practical uh, example about this. Um, city streets. Um, in San Jose, California, for example, we are at the moment piloting together with Mercedes-Benz an on-demand um, ride-hailing service with automated vehicles in, um, yeah, in San Jose, so in California, so not, not in Germany, uh, unfortunately, uh, which is app-based. So there will be automatic, uh, automated driving vehicles um, going through San Jose. And the aim of this project is not only to um, gain valuable insights for technical development, but rather to um, answer the question of how self-driving cars can, can fit in the uh, urban mobility puzzle. So we are, um, we are learning. So we do not know how it will look like someday, but we are trying things out. Um, that's what I, what I want to say, okay? Yep, I will be a bit quicker. Um, I already told you something about boundary conditions, and um, um, as you can imagine, um, we are uh, always um, dealing with political boundary conditions, technical uh, requirements, standardization, industry-specific uh, standards, standards for data exchange, and all things like this. We are, of course, trying to influence them, but uh, usually we are only one of the players who are trying to do that. Um, we are then heavily relying on guiding principles, which is um, to say the foremost data sovereignty. Data sovereignty is a term which is uh, to today used uh, very heavily, for example, from uh, the European Union and the new commission. So nobody really knows what it means. So is it infrastructure or is it uh, other, other things? So we are uh, working on defining that, but we are uh, as, as uh, politicians and as um, scientists um, uh, do using the term. And my last slide is um, about public interest. So there's only uh, there's always a limitation in Deva, uh, data sovereignty when there is um, public interest to be taken into consideration. And um, one way to deal with um, uh, these contractual questions are voluntary data partnerships. So when different parties form these partnerships, there can be, uh, there can always be, of course, a contractual agreement. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Hong, who's a founder of Pineapple Laboratories and the Invisible Project. And her work combines independent art-based research and open science practices to address the issues on global south, intersectional design, gender diverse communities, and sustainable development goals. She's trained in materials engineering, natural sciences, and clinical research, and uh, holds a PhD and is a Max Planck alumni. Uh, born and raised in Venezuela, she identifies as trans and has been a speaker at OpenCon 17 and 18, UNESCO Chair in Technology for Development, a uh, few to mention. Welcome to hold your presentation. 
Thank you, Alina. So I met Alina in the, um, the Max Planck Symposia, so thank you so much. And there I was talking um, about um, the issue of safety in public space and the topic of trans identities and actually access to public space. So we need to understand that public space must be safe. And not everybody navigates public space in the same way because it's very subjected to how our experiences as a human. It's not the same to navigate the, the world as a white man than to navigate the world as a woman, as a white cisgender woman, or to navigate the world as a transgender woman of color. When it comes to design, trans people, intersex, and non-binary people are extremely at risk and at vulnerable positions. And it's kind of very funny because I just arrived, uh, I don't know, an hour ago, and it took me maybe like 20 minutes to find uh, my badge because my ID didn't, you know, didn't correspond to the data that I entered in the database. So like infrastructure is actually not from still in the digital, in this digital uh, space, is not accommodating um, these topics. So it's important to talk about intersectional design, and we're talking about intersectional design, we need to uh, address issues as migration, issues as race and gender. I am a, a migrant, I am a racialized person, I have an education of 100,000 euros, I have a PhD in Germany, I also have international research experience in Israel, yet it is a barrier for many of us. It is very important when we consider design of technologies to think that we need a collective process and that we need to include also minorities into this equation. So I don't represent an entire community. Uh, there are many uh, transgender people all around the world and they have also different they are very much constrained and limited by geopolitical, um, geopolitical boundaries. So they cannot easily navigate public space. So when, it's, uh, when we're talking about designing technology, we need to gather collective information from different parts of the world, because it's not the same for a trans person to walk to be in public space in Latin America, that is uh, to be also in other places, let's say in Europe or the Middle East. So this is very much like, uh, let's uh, think about the design and how can uh, future technologies can embrace this type of question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear speakers, thank you very, very much for your contributions. I think it was already really great background for our um, group discussions on what, how to govern, what values should govern data in smart city mobility context. So thanks again. And um, if we can ba get back our slide set, I would explain then uh, the workshop methodology. So um, I will go through the workshop methodology. We decided to go with a method which would allow uh, hopefully for all of you to participate in the dialogue about smart city mobility, and it's called one, two, four method. But don't worry about the name, I will explain several times during the workshop how it goes. We will start with individual brainstorming. You see in front of you there are post-its, and I invite you to uh, write down then uh, your thoughts about data governance. And uh, after this stage, you, you can start now, or you can uh, wait until the actual three minute uh, timeline starts. Uh, then uh, the next part would be is that you find a person close to you who you don't already know, and then you discuss together what, what have you found about data governance, what values do you find important, and um, yeah, we will show the questions in the next slide. And the next part of the method is that two pairs will pair up again, so form groups of four, 
and then discuss the topics together. And towards the end of the seven minutes, uh, you will select one person from your group who will then represent uh, you in the last stage uh, of the workshop. And in the last stage, you may see that there are um, kind of flip charty papers on, uh, in four points uh, here. And uh, our speakers, and also um, Holger Dietrich from Sozialhelden, are uh, uh, then uh, moderating or facilitating the discussion by this table and uh, by this flip chart. And uh, in the final stage, we will wrap up the findings on uh, data governance in the discussion here, where uh, the moderators will bring the results discussed in their group uh, here to the stage. And um, if, uh, wait, where is the, yeah. And the questions which we invite to discuss is uh, for you, to identify from your perspective, from the country and the continent uh, where you come from, what are the differences at stake in relation to data and smart city mobility? And we really encourage to draw from your experience because it's rare that to have in a room so, so diverse group and so international group of participants. And also, uh, we invite to discuss which of the interests may be in conflict. And finally, how data governance may address these problems. And just to illustrate with an example how this can go, and drawing from my experience of being Finnish, right now in Finland it's extremely dark. So a lot of smart city initiatives, they coincide with smart street initiatives. And there are pilots, for example, for more envi environmentally friendly and smarter control of street lights. And I recently read about this initiative where uh, they uh, suggested that there would be a system where you can uh, order with your cell phone uh, street lights into a nearby park when you want in the evening to go for a run there. And so we have here, um, I will use just, yeah, so interest in sustainability, which we can recognize. And as a follow-up in this project, there was also an idea that, well, actually, either cities or companies could also ask reimbursement from these services, so you kind of pay for the lightning as you go. So it looks like a business opportunity. But this suggestion, I think it raises a lot of questions. So first, I don't think there were many women involved in the design of this um, uh, pilot because mm, so how, like, <laughs> are you comfortable with somebody knowing from the data that you're going uh, to the park alone for a, for a run? Also, I mean, not all people have uh, smartphones, so those who don't have smartphones, they can't use the system, so shall they walk in the dark? And uh, finally, also, people who can't pay for these services, so there are a lot of questions related to, re um, to uh, equality, there are questions related to public safety. And then finally, questions about provision of public services. And obviously, privacy. Because what happens with your running data at night? Um, so finally, if we look at the uh, possible solutions, we might think that on the level of data governance, maybe there's a possibility to devise a sustainable solution that doesn't require that personal data about you. So we would, could refer to the principle of data minimalization. Then we would need to have a dialogue uh, what services should be public and what could be private, private, privatized. And then finally, as we discussed earlier, we need inclusion and intersectionality in the design of such systems. And I'm sure that uh, from where you come from, from your city, you can think of other interesting or tensions or examples of how smart city mobility could be executed in the way that it supports the UN development uh, goals. Yeah, I would like just to address um, a word. It's not about inclusion design, because when we're talking about inclusion, is who, in, who is including who, what, and how. So we need to talk about intersectionality. So I just wanted to address that. Who is in the position to include who, in what, and how? Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you for the comment. So now our next stage is actually to start the workshop. So now we take three minutes and please jot down the ideas that you have um, on the post-its on these three topics. Um, so moderators can just, uh, ah, it's in the last stage, so I will, I will tell them, yeah. So, um, now I think it's for 15 minutes, you can just hang out and I will tell them to uh, go uh, to the third chair. Yeah, you have a for 15 minutes. Yeah. Do you want to control this? It's already gone the moment. <laughs> Is it, uh, are we there yet? So, uh, next stage in the workshop, please pair up with someone you don't know and discuss together what you have written down. And you're encouraged to group up your thoughts and if you find connections or arrange them so you can work creatively with what you discover in the discussion. And five minutes for this stage.
Okay, 10 seconds left. Prepare to close the sharing and write down your ideas. Um, it's still in um, seven minutes, so you can still uh, have a break. Yeah. So, thank you for pair discussion. Now, find another pair and discuss with them again. Please break your intimate discussion with one person and include another pair to your discussion. And as a message to online participants, you are very welcome to answer to these questions online.
to start distributing them. Now, groups of four, a reminder, at this stage, please select one person from your group who will report about your data governance findings in the next stage. Okay, we're approaching the next stage of our workshop. So in the next stage, first, I will invite the moderators to approach flip charts. So Mr. Choi will start with flip chart A. Then uh, Dr. Hang will be present at the flip ch chart B. Then uh, who we, ah, we have Hoge. Dietrich at the um, flip chart C, and then uh, Christian Krauvogel at the flip chart D. Now, could the leaders or rapporteurs of the groups of four raise their hands? 
Uh, could you please select uh, rapporteurs from the groups who haven't selected it yet? Okay, so uh, here these two uh, groups in front would come to discuss, uh, not the groups, but actually rapporteurs would discuss with uh, Mr. Choi what they have found for the next 10 minutes. Then the two groups in the back will discuss with, again, sorry, groups, the rapporteurs, but groups can be present. Uh, rapporteurs will discuss with um, Dr. Hung. Then the leaders in the two groups here in the back will uh, join Holger Dietrich, and the two groups here, and their, um, their rapporteurs will uh, join Christian Graufogel. So please, uh, rapporteurs, approach uh, respective um, moderators. And as a note, uh, invitation to group impostics creatively and discuss wh whether they can be regrouped in, in a way that makes even more sense to you. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah I will say that the ad hoc group will get more time so they can okay. send class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Suggest that they bring us maybe should we, take the, should we take this one actually to, to the stage, the split chart? I think it would be easier. Yeah. For others, it's still hard to see like what. Uh, I mean, it's more that they know how to read, but since the camera is pointing this way, then uh, at least they're kind of. Yeah. One minute left. So, thank you for the lively group discussions and very collaborative effort to discuss data governance. Now, I would kindly ask the moderators of the group wrap up and come back to the stage and to bring the flip charts uh, with them. Group B, please proceed to the stage. Oh, oh, okay. Can I start? I think it's on. Can I, can I start? Just one second. Um. Max? So, um, we will start with our first group. Uh, Mr. Choi, would you like to share what were the core topics that oh. were discussed about okay. data governance? Okay, let's get started uh, A group. Uh, fortunately, uh, our group is, consists of very, very smart people. <laughs> I think I'm very lucky. And then I never imagined that I uh, moderate a very important valuable session in my life in Berlin. <laughs> you be in Berlin. Okay. Start with A group. Uh, there's uh, several uh, concerns and interests. That is about my group uh, just focus on the uh, their 
policy suggestion. The policy suggestion is our group's interest. Okay. First of all, multi-stakeholder cooperation for accountability. You know the accountability is that uh, different from uh, responsibility. The responsibility is that somebody just make a mistake and they supposed to take uh, some legal or ethical burden to take care of everything. But accountability means that uh, how you use data for what and what kind of outcome uh, has been come out uh, and how, what kind of way. That is accountability. That means explainability. But usually data uh, has, very, has been regarded very useful as that. But people or IT company cannot explain why, how, what kind of data is come out like that. This is very important. And then uh, one, of my, uh, one of A group suggestion, uh, debaters suggest that probably companies should cooperate with public city officials because we, uh, without, without public city intervention or some kind of the technical requirement asking, private company will have a full leeway, whatever they want. This is kind of laissez-faire, no regulation, no any guiding principle. That means cooperation means in the other way, it's kind of, kind of public needs asking, uh, should be asked in, when they design technical principle of a smart city. The second, Second one is that anonymity and the identification. This is a very core value because uh, because even though they uh, data governance, uh, data governance, data uh, smart city data going to be need by uh, some reason. They uh, without that some specific reason, all of the data should be anonymized. Instead of this, 100% uh, data is openly available and with a identification. That's what happened in Xinjiang uh, Xinjiang city in, in China. This is not the uh, democratic countries. And the third one is the reconciling completing value. Even though the, you have some efficiency of the smart city, we need also protection of privacy. And these cities should get noticed how, what kind of data they already used, or sometimes sometime not. And the monitoring of the marginal People, then monitoring is not suggestive. Monitoring is the concern. What if smart city just monitored the specific purpose of the marginal people? For example, migrant. So many very poor, very marginal people has been targeted of the hatred. You know that in Hong Kong there's a lot of protests and there's, there's some application who track down the protest groups. This is really a nightmare of the democratic situation. And another one is uh, is much more uh, ultimate keyword I can suggest the tech design. The kind of uh, infrastructure is consists of tech design. This is a, which should guarantee privacy. There's a two coding. First coding is a code made by law in Congress. The second coding is a tech government tech giant should have a day on design principle. Well, tech giant, for example, why they have full, full, full availability, the capacity to make a tech design we have, we have without respect of privacy. That's a, that's a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the entire group who contributed to this uh, flip chart. Then next, uh, group B. And each group has two minutes. And I kindly also suggest that you would mention if you had something very similar, that just tell her, okay, our group also found this important, but then highlight the things which haven't been mentioned yet. So the group, oh, yes, microphone. Hi. Um, I'm Kamala Neta from Pineapple Laboratories. Um, we had input from a small group, and we sort of identified first who are like the players, the actors, or the users in this problematic. And we had the luck to have a urbanist who is also a designer and help also to identify uh, the conflicts of these different players. So we identify first the users who are affected by this problematic, and we can talk about one, um, citizens of every day, second, science, third, public policies, and fourth, businesses. 
So how these things are related to each other are explained in a little diagram that was um, visualized by our friend from Sao Paulo, right? Um, and there are also issues that are connecting these actors, which are basically privacy and data access. So how do you provide um, both things, access and data protection, and how you make these people vulnerable? So this is also a, a huge cosmology that, in my opinion, it's a collective process. And I just want to start with the question, who is in this room, who is transgender, and who can talk about these particular issues? At the moment, it's only me who is in the room, but I just want to speak also from a bunch of people that I know outside who cannot be in this privileged space, and how these people are actually having a voice in a democratic system. We also have here an intervention from a colleague from uh, Rio, who is b very basically concerned about safety in mobility in public space. This issue needs to be rethink because we are also need to think why are people so scared? Why are people so scared about talking about these issues? Because people are traumatized, and who is the person developing such technologies? So. This, I work as a, as a designer and I work also as an artist and my approach is to also feel the concerns of the user from an art perspective. Now, what I see, um, I'm not a politician, uh, but maybe um, you have a little bit more of, uh, of uh, something you would like to add? From the urban perspective. Yeah, from the urban perspective, like the best practices are and they are being developed concerned uh, with the um, participatory measures in general. So if you put all these players to discuss it, it and if, if uh, you create an application or something, if you use the, the platforms of a smart city um, mobility to put the, the players together to discuss and to create and to develop it as a process, as a continued process, that, that's the best practice to know we have. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to the entire group. Now, um, well, group D is uh, ready. C. Sorry, C, ah, sorry. Okay. I tried to make this quick, so our discussion was more, the, I mean, the topic was about governance in smart city mobility. We had more like smart city data and governance, but uh, one group, like we came together, two groups came together to one, was very much focusing on mobility, which means public transportation, private transportation. So we, we had some things in common which have, have already been mentioned, like uh, the dilemma between privacy versus open data. I clustered this as sovereignty of data. So fear of surveillance state, who owns city data, who has a say, who shall share with whom. This is a whole spectrum of, of problems in this case, of challenges. Also having a say means transparency in decision making. What is implemented, by whom, under what conditions, will there be corruption maybe? How can people have the capacity to inter as, as citizens to intervene in, in such processes to build um, smart city mobility applications? This is this cluster. Then the practical implementation. So if you do something really big and implement everything, it might be outdated when it's finished. So how can you move fast, but also step by step to be up to date with the technology? Uh, and also very practical, like what data formats are there? Um, how, where can I find documentation? Who can use this? How can I find this? So very technical, quest practical questions. Um, and also the equality in general, like there should be universal access for everybody to new services. You, you don't have to have this technology to use this. This is this other cluster. And in the center of all this are all the promises we collected, or this one group collected, which is, you know, what you said in the beginning, also safety, efficiency, maybe quality of, uh, and, and of travel, maybe better pleasure, less traffic jams, things like this, and clean air. The list goes on. And so this is more like the promises of all this mobility, smart mobility uh, solutions. And around this, there are different forces uh, challenging all this. This is what we, what we did in our group. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you to the entire group for their input. Then the group D.
We are, we are doing this together since, uh, as in Group C, we collected input from two uh, working groups, and uh, also as in Group C, um, we defined, uh, or uh, our rapporteurs defined um, something like an ecosystem um, where uh, different interests have to be taken into account, um, which means that you have a, a societal sphere, you have a data, data management sphere, and a private public interest sphere, which have to interact. And now I'm handing over to my colleague. So. I think we, we tackled mainly the, the same questions as in, in Group C. So we have the, quest, the, the, the part of the data management where it was mentioned that data sovereignty um, is an important aspect which needs to be taken into account. And um, basically the, the individual data control is important into, in, in the entire design process. And then um, that basically feeds back into the question of the public good or the societal impact, how you want, however you want to call it. So, one case, one particular case was that um, data can help blind people to navigate in the city. So actually, that's a question of the data impact, uh, but that of course is um, strongly linked with the question of data management. And then in the middle, we have the question of the public and the private interest. So if you have um, private companies in between um, that sections, um, they of course have a different interest than the end user. So and that's basically the the ecosystem which needs to be taken into account in the design process. So, did I miss something you want to add? That was very good. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the speakers and moderators and for the groups. Uh, I thought that maybe you have an idea how to wrap up. I'm overwhelmed because these are really sophisticated uh, analysis of data governance models. And we will write uh, two reports on it. And I think we might reach, uh, let's say, more straight conclusions. Uh, maybe if you have some, yes, something Yes, I have comment? a very practical conclusion. Um, could you maybe leave all your uh, little uh, post-its um, right on the table? Because uh, one of the um, uh, in very original ideas to organize this work workshop was that this is one of the rare occasions where you get so many different people from so many different regions together and to finally overcome uh, the typical cultural national perspective. And when I was just dropping from group to group, I was so um, actually enlightened to really see, ah, yeah, okay, uh, that's really interesting, this problem, because I hadn't seen it before. So um, even though some of you might think, hey, um, not all of the interest conflicts, et, um, et cetera, are really now on, on these screens, please leave it, leave it there, because we would like to work with it yeah, in our um, um, academic research later on. And from this perspective, I would say it was really um, even more than uh, what I expected, and I expected a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for your participations and to the speakers and moderators and also to our working group.